Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I very much appreciate the talk here uh, with you. It was very tight. I'm just coming from a three days uh, fundamental rights seminar for judges. So I have to switch now from a very legal mode in a, in a very technical mode or rather technical mode. However, I very much appreciate to be here. I want to emphasize maybe one thing uh, which is quite uh, important for my professional career, what I did uh, is actually I was, uh, if some of you might have heard of data retention in Europe and uh, some proceeding, legal proceeding leading to the abolishment of the directive there, I had the pleasure to write the mass complaint and lead it uh, and amongst others we brought down data retention directive, uh, whereas it's just a partial win because at least it's now illegal but it's still done. So, uh, but that is something which is uh, very much, very much in the focus of my work, all the topic of telecommunication uh, combined with the topic of human rights. So I'm a technical engineer and, uh, and a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, and I try to kind of be an interpreter between those two disciplines. Uh, I think, I rather guess, that the majority of you here is technician. May I ask who has a technical background here in the audience? Okay. May I, I just want to try, so I want to catch you where you are. Who, uh, who has a social science uh, background? And also, okay. Who has a legal background there? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I, got, I guess. Okay, okay. Thank you. I, I will very much try, but I think uh, uh, there won't be such a problem with human rights to put it, make it not too much uh, law impressed there. So we are talking about from my point of view, uh, about the question of the evolution of human rights in a digital world. So it's not something really new. It's not really, from my point of view, a revolution. It's rather an evolution. Uh, and as we hear, everything is smart nowadays. Yeah? Everything has some term of smart city, smart traffic and everything. So why not to have some smart rights uh, and particularly for smart citizens, because this one I can already put ahead. Whatever problems we have with data protection or digital rights or whatever, we won't solve it with repressive measures alone or with technical measures. It will always be a big measure of education of people and to raise the basic standard there, so that as my basic approach there. <coughs> we are talking about the so-called Internet of Things. I <coughs> Here in this conference, I hardly have to explain what this term means. However, I want to emphasize one thing that I consider important from both the technical side and a regulative and a, a legal normative side. We talk about internet, the internet of things, suggesting that uh, all these things that are nowadays somehow connected in a network using one single standard like TCP IP and everything is harmonized. And of course, that's not true. So internet of things is a very shortcut term, as you all, I guess, know. Uh, we are talking about a huge number of different vendors in, uh, uh, interfaces particularly, and there lies, the, the devil lies in the deep very often, and that's how it is also with the question how we really come, uh, let's say, it, at least to a respect of human rights uh, and the idea behind human rights, which is actually human dignity. Uh, and let's not talk about privacy by design or something. I want to talk about human dignity by design, because these things are working for us, not we for them. So smart, what is smart? Whoever is dealing with uh, the topic of smart living or smart city uh, would actually start to say boo now when you see these pictures because that was maybe fancy about 10 years ago if you were talking about Internet of Things, but the fridge uh, that is able to see if it has still milk or not and however to communicate is a very old thing. If we have this set up, uh, uh, nowadays, I just didn't find a better picture. It would rather be the question how it's communicating with which drone that right away is going to fly in the supermarket for picking up everything and something m highly more sophis sophisticated, which shows us both a huge potential, a huge potential of really making our lives better, of really helping us as humans to develop uh, when we talk, for example, about things like uh, active and assistant living, or it was called previously ambient assistant living, that means how technology 
is going to accompany us when we need help, when we particularly grow older, but for whatever reason we need help. So the basic question is actually, how do we concept these things, how do we develop these things for really considering the idea of what means to live in dignity, in human dignity, with technology. And of course the term of human dignity is <laughs> it's a very, very hard term to really grab when it comes to specify some uh, interface for connected things and so on. So let's try to see where we have first the fields of application and then I want to talk about how we can use this idea that coming with human rights and fundamental rights along and transpose it in this technical world. Uh, I think I will not <coughs> tell you a lot of new things with uh, these standards. I mean, for me, Internet of Things is, of course, very much connected with the idea of semantic web, uh, with the idea of ontologies, of learning machines. This is something what we have very common in legal informatics. So more and more we have some examples, uh, let's say the stock market, for example, where 40% is anyway already going along uh, by robots actually buying things, uh, just being appointed of their masters. <coughs> we have so-called machine-to-machine -machine communication, no matter if these are really actual physical things or not that are connected with it. We have the semantic web, we have ontologies. <clears throat> that means uh, we start to talk really about artificial intelligence. I don't say now how intelligent this artificial intelligence is, but it is already able to learn. We have, of course, all the part that us concerning much more as a society, as humans, like social web, what is in the public domain, the so-called, uh, all the communication thing, the, the living thing, how our houses, how our, uh, all the traffic and everything starts to be connected up to the question how we get comfort when we need help by technology. We are talking about a big part, of course, that is very relevant when it comes to the interface between private industries and governments and all our uh, governing systems because the topic of open government data is very much connected also with the question how much empowerment we get through these things. This is a very, uh, very important aspect. How much does these developments of an Internet of Things, of uh, machines, really help us also to empower civil society? I just want to drop here uh, some <laughs> uh, words about net neutrality, as a lot of you might know. So if we have not the fast lane, but we all together, 90% of the people have the slow lane and some high, huge companies have the fast lane in the internet, we can develop whatever we want. We won't be able to really use these things and develop these things for us. It's a, a real core democratic question which we have there on the technology sector. We talk about smart production in, in German, it's called Industry 4.0, a terrible term. Uh, uh, so we talk about smart production uh, through all economy chain, through all the delivery chain, <coughs> but also about huge things like healthcare, social care, mobility, energy, and coming along with this, the question of, of course, critical infrastructures when it comes to security terms. <coughs> so we have one main question in all this coming up, and that is the idea of self-determination and also of self-responsibility, how much we can interfere, how much uh, responsibility we have to take, but also especially the question, what about the responsibility of those who develop that concept? Digital human rights as a concept, from my point of view, um, is something that has to be con considered in times where we all talk about data protection and the basic regulation and so sometimes it looks like data protection is the only human right or, or fundamental rights guarantee in that is relevant in the IT world in some cyberspace online world whatever that's of course not uh, enough because we need to consider all kind of human rights. Uh, that is something what the United Nations Human Rights Council a couple of years ago um, already stated clearly in a, in a resolution that all kind of classical human rights like freedom of information, freedom of opinion, uh, 
even freedom of assembly uh, have to be granted not just in the offline world, but also in some online or cyber world. <coughs> Whereas, of course, we all know that they are melted together because communication might go online, but it is something very real for human. So the question is the meaning still. What does these rights mean in this online world? Because can I say a denial of service attack is a freedom of assembly? In a, what about the DDoS? Then just to put some questions, there are a lot of things that not, are not yet clear when we try to transpose the idea of human rights that have been basically developed in the last 300 years, mainly in the last 100 years, to a very new world with different questions. The idea of data protection, of course, is not new. We have uh, quite long already a right to privacy and, uh, of course, also known as a core of human dignity when it came from the history of philosophy uh, uh, in Europe. We have this idea of a liberal society and freedom of citizens, the sanctity of the house, the secrecy of letter, uh, uh, that a legal base has to be done, that we need a judge degree for interfering in the house uh, or, or in the correspondence. But <coughs> the question is, if we also really are able to transpose these ideas into an online world, because uh, you all know how much we are talking about problems of uh, encryption, for example. If you think about the fight between Google, uh, uh, between Apple and the FBI, uh, and the question, shall encryption be allowed at all or not, that we are debating, uh, I have the feeling we are exactly there uh, about 200 years ago when our ancestors had to discuss about if there shall be some sanctity, some secrecy of the home. We have a new uh, dimension. We have a, a huge possibility, a huge chance for a more democratic development of a more democratic society by the means of all this technology. On the other side, we have also a huge potential of control over citizens, uh, clearly uh, visible or not. I don't like dystopies. I much more like utopies, and I think it's far not too late. We have a lot of, especially as uh, technicians sitting here, having really the power of the mind to develop better things, to develop things where we can from the beginning avoid. Uh, we have, a, I will be very short about this, about the uh, actually the development of a human rights in uh, the cyberspace or IT human rights. Uh, we're coming, of course, from the very basic of privacy protection according to Article 8 of the European Human Rights Convention. But uh, it developed, and the, especially the development in Germany was very interesting because they already in the 83 years, they derived it from the core in Article 1 of the German Constitution, there is uh, uh, the sanctity of human dignity. And from Article 2, which is the uh, individual right of self-determination. And they combine this to a right of information or self-determination. Which is a far better term than data protection because, I mean, sometimes I think data protection pretends that there are some little data being afraid in some corner of being abused. But it's not the data, it's about our interest, it's about uh, uh, human interests, legitimate interests there, which have to be protected. So, right to information and self-determination might be a word monster, but it's still bringing better to the point what it's all about. <coughs> we have limitations, we have systems, it's not like uh, the internet is not a... Uh, 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 a, a room without law, as we hear sometimes from both sides, neither from regulation nor from uh, legal rules about the freedom we have. Because all these things apply, we have to ask if there are any restraints there, if we uh, have a really necessity and necessity in a democratic society for it. We have to ask, is there a really pressing social need as quoted from the European uh, uh, Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And, um, of course, the states do enjoy a certain margin of appreciation, but there are some things that can be objectively asked that we come to the so-called balance of interest according to the proportionality principle. This is something very important, and sometimes in discussions, 
proportionality is put as a meaningless keyword, but it is not. It is something very developed with a systematic behind it from the, the, the high courts of this, uh, of this uh, continent. We have to ask if there is a legitimate aim, if this measure is at all suitable to reach that aim, just to mention how suitable, how effective is data retention for fighting terrorism uh, uh, as one question when we talk really about big data. <coughs> we have to ask if there are maybe alternatives that could serve the same purpose but less interfering in our uh, spheres of freedom and our rights. And uh, in the end, of course, if it's uh, in a balance, if it's actually uh, uh, in some equilibrium, and if there are additional, uh, if there are enough safeguards uh, to really guarantee that we keep a proportionality. Now coming directly to some particular challenges when we talk about data protection and big data. I put in the title of my presentation uh, uh, with a question mark if that is a relation with future. And there are indeed some antagonisms between the two concepts, between the concept of data protection and the concept of what we call big data, however diffuse it might be, what we understand under that term. The first real collision kind of, at least, of the concept is that data protection as its core principle is asking about the purpose limitation. Whereas in the idea of big data, at least as we are living it, it is somehow we are collecting, that's why the amounts of data get big, and we might not even know yet all the questions we want to ask to that data, but we know we're going to find the answer for it. And that is somehow not really going together with the concept of purpose limitation. So what we actually need to ask is, since this is just a matter of fact, and we are not going to discuss if we now let's stop to do big data because of human rights, I'm very much aware of that and that's not what I want. What I want to know is what is the approach to catch actually that phenomenon. And what is, if we use the things for purposes, what about the purposes? Um, and there is some very, very important part that's coming along, uh, fortunately with the new data protection basic regulations entering into force in 2018, which will mandatory, in particular when new technologies are at stake, uh, require a risk assessment, a data protection risk assessment, where uh, big companies can be li held liable if they just did not address risks that would be at least somehow obvious. And this combined with the threat of punishment of fees up to 4 million euro or 4% of the annual turnaround for that is something which is going to hurt even Google or Facebook or however the big ones are called. So this is some uh, thing what I see uh, as a positive approach. Um, <coughs> What is extremely important, where I'm not happy with the data protection uh, uh, basic regulation which is coming, because they left purposely, because there was no political uh, agreement to that, much space for the question of automated decisions and profiling. That is going to be a big topic as we are talking about big data. Any kind of profiles, but particularly, of course, credit scoring. Credit scoring is a real runner in that question. And, um, the question, of course, how these rights, what are there? That means that you are basically not allowed to be exposed to a merely automated decision if it has legal impact or other heavily impact to your life. Yeah? The question is, how do we grab that, how we can enforce that? That we have theoretically now already as a theory and uh, it's not really working. Of course, we have on another side uh, a rather dystopic scenario when we talk about big data in uh, the law enforcement. I was just uh, about two months ago in a conference in, within the so-called project mapping, which is led by uh, Professor Joe Kanatachi, the, the quite newly appointed UN Special Rapporteur on Privacy and Surveillance. And we were talking, we had a presentation of an English uh, um, research company that developed for the police of, of Sheffield there, uh, no sorry, of Nottingham there, uh, a, an extremely powerful tool, an extremely mighty tool for predictive policing, calculating all the, the plans uh, of, of uh, the stuff there and 
already predicting the routes and suggesting the routes where they are going and so on, based on a private database, a, a, a huge database over all citizens of United Kingdom that is in, in possession of a private company and the police pays a license to access that company, yeah? to access that database. And they get, they really proud said, yeah, yeah, we got, we got that uh, license there. And we were also thinking, said the lady in the presentation, we were also thinking, this is somehow strange, but then we thought the police is using it and they even pay for it, so it must be lawful. And these things are going to do the predictive policing for us. So this is something where I really want to have some control. And there we come to a, a, a very crucial part for me. And that is the question of the standards. Where do we define the norms, the technical norms? Those things where the politicians, the legislators, typically the lawyers, stop to look at it and say, oh, no, this is uh, at the state of the art technical state of the art is what you find in some legal base there and the politicians are not about to negotiate what exactly is in some uh, uh, smaller in some like Etsy standard there but when we have a closer look we see that there is the uh, everything you wish of the intelligence services of this world in the Etsy we know since many times that there are is the who is who of secret services intelligence services of this world so we have to see uh, as I say, however critical you see it, approaches like very carefully in ICANN, for example, at least to try to put in some democrat the democratic elements there, is something that could fit us very good. I come now to my conclusions. Legislation have to consider, of course, uh, uh, interests, balance interests, and making previous risk assessment when they regula regulating also a room. Uh, what I think is we need a real human rights-based approach in technology development because technology development is very international and so are human rights, so we have a common uh, base and understanding there. And we need especially to think about the balance of security and freedom in an open societal dialogue. I'm not just talking about that kind of surveillance that NSA and our services are doing. Uh, I'm also talking about what we do on the level of enterprises in our workfare programs, in our all day where we are working. The same questions, security and freedom. Legal framework needs to consider technological aspects and on the other side, technology needs to have more design thinking, design approach in concepts. And the repressive approach won't be enough. I want to close how I started, education, education and education is what we need. Thank you very much. And again, are there any questions from the audience? Um, uh, I, was, I just wanted to mention, because I think, uh, Christoph Fabianek, um, you're just doing some startup uh, concerning data uh, and private, uh, private data, isn't it? You want to uh, shortly present it, or if you like it? Don't be afraid, I'm not biting. <laughs> Even I'm a lawyer, I know. Okay. Um, well, say something. Well, um, hello, my name is Christopher Bjarnik. Uh, I'm working also in this area. And uh, what we currently see is that currently mainly big companies, corporations benefit from the data that we produce. So basically, we're giving it away for free. We give uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon our data. Currently, our latest data is they earn $200 million a day with our data. Uh, and currently, there is maybe there is some legal stuff, uh, but they just don't care. Uh, especially in Europe, we currently have Ireland, who is uh, on the forefront uh, working in this area. And when you go to Facebook and say you want your data, you just get an email, and basically you can't do anything. And what we are doing in our startup is we just want to give back the data to the people and want to enable them, give some algorithms to do something. Because I think what is important is, yes, so important it is on the legal side to uh, create laws, to uh, work on this side. I think it must come from the people, from the down up. Uh, just do something on your own. And this is what we're doing in On Your Data. If you're interested, I'm more than happy to tell you afterwards, but I don't want to speak too long. Hopefully, I think one of the next talks uh, I will present On Your Data here at an IoT meetup. Thank you. Thank you.
May I have a very short response to that because that's an interesting query. Of course, you're absolutely right. Bottom up technology development, please all go ahead. That's why I still believe in it. But uh, on your particular question, I have uh, uh, two students since about one year and I hope I don't know yet. I think they're not yet done with their papers, especially about this question of what is the value of the data and how much they earn with it. And we have one legal instrument. It's in Austrian law, but in many uh, legal orders within Europe is called lesio enormis, which means actually that the contract is null if uh, the value of uh, uh, the, the what you what re you receive for what you give is not even the half. This is an objective inequivalent of uh, what both si sides have to give, and that means you could fight such a contract. Yeah? And if you think this through. What do you get? Because it's a contract. You agree to give away your data with a business card. You get some rabat. You get some percentages there of your shopping. So calculate how much you get. And on the other side, ask how much they earn. And then we see if we have some equivalence there. Now, I think this is definitely a topic that will uh, come up uh, even more in the future. I just uh, recall one, one article I read about uh, the Chinese uh, government. I think they are just building some credit scoring system. And the funny thing is, your credit score, that means uh, whether you're allowed to buy online via this, this Amazon, uh, this Chinese Amazon uh, system, um, depends upon which friends you have. So the, the person you're friends with have an impact on your credit score. And that's a little bit eerie. I mean, really scary. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Thank you a lot. Thank you.